You know, I always feel bad for Thomas. He really doesn't deserve the adjective that always gets put on to his name. Doubting Thomas. I mean, it, it really does him a disservice. Instead, what if we called him sensible Thomas? Or practical Thomas? Or doesn't believe everything he hears from his buddies, especially when it makes no logical sense, Thomas? I think I like that one. Maybe we can make an, an acronym, acronym out of it, and let's see if I can pronounce this right. Behefwabemimils. That, that first D is silent. You see, I think sometimes we get so used to hearing Jesus' resurrection that we start to assume that someone who doesn't believe in the resurrection has something wrong with them. We just... We forget that someone coming back from the dead is weird. It's not something that we encounter in our daily life. And it's something quite out of the ordinary. It's especially so for someone who's crucified. Because the Romans didn't mess around. They had this tradition that if someone is sentenced to execution and they don't end up dead, the executioner receives the sentence. How's that for motivation to make sure somebody's actually dead? The people of Jesus' time knew that folk didn't come back from a crucifixion. I mean, sure, sometimes, I mean, there's, there's always stories of people who they thought they were dead and then somebody accidentally spills a little bit of whiskey on them and they wake up, like in Finnegan's Wake, right? But normally... When somebody's dead, especially from a crucifixion, and remember, Jesus did get stabbed through the heart, you don't come back from that. And yet somehow, Thomas has become the bad guy. Thomas is the one that doesn't believe. Of course, it's kind of precious that if you read the account in Luke's gospel, when the women show up to tell the disciples that Jesus has risen, okay, I'll, I'll spot you that when I was a little tricky there. Luke tells us that they did not believe the women because their words seemed to them like nonsense. It wasn't until Jesus very literally showed up in their living room that they believed. And yet Thomas, Thomas is the one that gets the bad rap. Now the other thing that Thomas did that he was rather well known for is he was the one that right before Jesus raised Lazarus from the dead and he, Jesus was talking about Jerusalem and the other disciples didn't want him to really go to Jerusalem because he knew that he and the whole lot of them were probably going to get killed. Thomas is the one that spoke up and said, all right, well, let's go. We'll just die with him. So Thomas, he was the one that kind of took the more bold steps. And yet he's the bad guy somehow. Really, I think that Thomas is exhibiting perfectly healthy behavior. All he wanted was proof. He could have thought that the other disciples were just overcome with grief and didn't know what they were talking about. He just wanted some proof. Unfortunately, even at this time, and then something that developed quite a bit later on in Christianity, apparently looking to find something out for yourself started to become frowned upon at some point. Um, I happen to remember some things in the Middle Ages that of people who thought something a little different than established truth, and it didn't go very well. Uh, there was a monk... You might know him, Martin Luther. He decided to start saying something that didn't quite fit with everything else, and he ended up excommunicated with the threat of death over his head, whatever he went. Um, you might have heard of a fellow named Copernicus or Galileo. Might have come across them once or twice. They were forced to recant their findings that now we know several hundred years later that were, at, were well, mostly right. Sure, somebody had to sort out the details later, but, you know, mostly right. They had to recant, or else they would have been under threat of excommunication and death. 
Now, look at what Jesus did when Thomas doubted. Did Jesus say, Thomas, you horrible, horrible person. How dare you doubt me? No. He said, Thomas, you wanted to see my hands? Here you go. You wanted to put your hand in my side? Go ahead. Jesus didn't ignore Thomas's doubts. He didn't chastise Thomas for having doubts. He said, you have doubts? Here I am. He answered Thomas. And it's an astonishingly more effective way of dealing with doubt than just kind of pretending they're not there. Because sometimes when we start to think that doubting is bad, we just kind of start putting stuff in a corner and we put 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 stuff in a corner corner until what happens? You got a full corner. It starts to look like my what is technically my eating area, but has turned into a storage room. Because you run into this situation where you just run out of room to put your doubts. And finally, it overwhelms you. And you have nothing left. Doubt can destroy you if you let it. But it can also lead us to do better. And I did mention Martin Luther, Martin Luther earlier. One of the things that led to him kind of kicking off something that is kind of a big deal was he doubted if human works like penance and confession and all these things, he doubted if those human institutions can actually do anything for his salvation. He wasn't sure if by doing all these things, saying, oh, however many prayers or climbing however many steps or whatever else, He doubted if that did any good. So he started to, as he was reading the Bible, he started to notice that salvation is a free gift to God's people because of Jesus' work on the cross. The doubts that he had ended up leading to a massive change in Christianity, the effects of which we still feel today. Now, sometimes we have a different kind of doubt. We doubt if we ourselves are forgiven. We doubt if Jesus really came back from the dead. We doubt if God exists at all. Or we'll see others struggling with these doubts and we wonder what we can do. What if we had the courage to explore these things? You might be amazed at what you can learn. Because I can remember when I was working through some of these things, when I was working through if God really was there. I ended up finding out something that brought me a great deal of comfort, even though it sounds a little bit counterintuitive. Because I couldn't get God. He just, God didn't make sense to me. And the more I thought about it, and the more I thought about it, the less sense God made. And then all of a sudden, something happened, and I went, wait a minute. If God made sense, why would I bother worshiping him? If I could understand everything about God, why would I need him? So through my process of doubt, of trying to figure out things about God, I came to have a stronger faith by asking questions that some people might not feel comfortable asking. But it led me to have a stronger faith than I did before. So maybe being a doubting Thomas shouldn't be such a bad thing. Especially when you realize what Thomas did after his doubts were confronted. He looked at Jesus and he just says, my Lord and my God. I can't think of a simpler proclamation of faith than that. My Lord and my God. And I think Jesus gets that it's not easy to believe some of these things. It's not easy to believe that someone came back from the dead. Because he said, blessed are those who have not yet seen and have yet believed. It's hard to accept things that seem too big to understand. I mean, 45 years ago, we put a man on the moon. And there's people who still think that was fake. 
And I'm sure some of you know people that worked on that project. That's 45 years. Now, blow it up. How can you expect someone to believe that 2,000 years ago, someone raised, was raised from the dead? But when we let those doubts exist, when we confront those doubts and we're willing to ask those kinds of questions, that's when we can start to grow in our faith. When we're willing to open ourselves up to ask those kinds of questions, we can see things that God might be doing that we didn't notice before. And that we too, like Thomas, can declare to Jesus that he is our Lord and our God. 